Hey, y'all, this is Jeff Ignatowski. I am the owner of Scorpion Lair Games, and you are watching Murder Metal Mayhem. This is Pete Altieri with Murder Metal Mayhem, and I've got the privilege to be interviewing Jeff Ignatowski of Scorpion Lair Games. He's a mastermind when it comes to creating games for lovers of true crime that are very realistic and well thought out. He's also the co-host of the Murder Metal Mayhem podcast with me, and I've been looking forward to talking with him about this new game and some more exciting stuff we're going to roll out, so... Jeff, uh, what's going on? And are you home in Cincinnati or out on the road slinging games? <laughs> this is actually my first weekend home in about <laughs> six weeks. Wow. So I, I have been on the road a bunch already this year, and it's been kind of nice to, uh, to actually be home and to be able to catch up on some domestic things that I need to get done around the house. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> as well as you know uh you know work never stops so i am constantly working on stuff and before we're done i will release this on here because uh uh it really hasn't been released anywhere else yet but i'll give you some new shit that i'm working on for next year already because uh we, we never sleep here that's awesome yeah i, I can relate to that for sure so uh, before we get into the new game, I always like to ask people involved in the true crime community, and you're certainly one, um, that what got you interested in true crime? What, was it some one incident? I know you and I know each other beyond this, but for our viewers, what, what is it that got you into that? So for me, like true crime has been a lifelong uh, interest, and it all started really, really young for me. Uh, now, we've joked around about this a bunch of times because, of course, uh, Altieri, uh, very, very Italian name. Yes. Uh, my last name is Ignatowski. <laughs> I am for sure a Polak. Right? I'm a dark-skinned Polak because I'm half Filipino, too. Uh, but I'm also a quarter German and a quarter Polish. And so my family, half of my family is all married in Italian, right? And so growing up, I was around uh, a lot of the true crime stuff. So my dad was friends with Angelo Bruno. I grew up right outside of Philadelphia. So we had a lot of connections. And, uh, you know, half of my family were all fronts for the mob anyway in the early 70s when they were having the riots in Philadelphia. So I grew up with all these stories uh, about the mob and, you know, about connected guys. And, and then, of course... The Sopranos comes out. When I was a kid, uh, The Godfather was a huge thing. So I kind of grew up in this culture that really romanticized the, the, the mob life. Right. And, you know, it was kind of just the culture that I grew up in. So I was always very familiar with that. You know, of course, as a kid, I wanted to be a little gangster and uh, wanted to run around and do all the things and had this code and uh, you know, I couldn't do that because I'm not Italian, uh, but I have the dark hair, I have the darker skin, so I could always pass off if I was with a bunch of Italians, <laughs> or if I was with a bunch of Puerto Ricans, or if I was with a bunch of Mexicans, I, I look like everybody. So I could fit in wherever, which was kind of nice to be a chameleon. Uh, but then we had a lot of stories when I was growing up. My dad met Manson in the early 60s before the murders. And so there was always a lot of true crime. So from a very, very early age, I was interested in it. Uh, you know, of course, when I was a kid, uh, O.J. Simpson was a big thing. Right. And that was like the first big thing on uh, court TV. Right? right. So we had watched court TV religiously when I was a kid. I watched that entire trial, uh, the O.J. Simpson trial, and then it rolled right into the Menendez brothers trial. Right. And so I watched all of that. 
So, you know, I would come home from school and me and my dad would sit at the dining room table and just watch court TV all night long. Uh, so I was really, really entrenched in true crime growing up. That's cool. Yeah. I'm similar with just being around that kind of stuff. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just interesting to hear what people, you know, what got people into true crime. I always love asking that question. And then I need to ask, so what made the bridge, the gap from that into the games and you starting Scorpion Lair games? Uh, how did that kind of start? So that that's a funny story because I had been uh, I've been creating games. I'm now I'll be 44 this year, right? So I'm getting old as shit. But, oh come on now, I'm 13 uh, years older than you. <laughs> I know. So I'm ancient. I, I got a lot of I got I got a lot of mileage, and I'm starting to feel the wear and tear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'll be 44 this year. But I started creating games when I was like eight years old. Uh, so it has been a long, long road. I've always been interested in that uh, from the time I was a kid trying to put together mechanics and things for games. But it wouldn't be, God, it was 30 plus, uh, almost 28 years probably after I created my first game that Scorpion Lair Games became a thing. And it was really because of my son uh, that all of this stuff happened. We were at a little oddity shop in uh, Kentucky, and we were there walking around, looking at a bunch of things. And we get up to the register. I think I was getting ready to buy something. And we get up to the register, and my son, he was, I guess, probably 15, 14, 15 at the time. Uh, he's now 18. But, uh, but yeah, he, he picked up this pack of cards and he's like, dad, buy me these cards. <laughs> and now if you know, if you know, I mean, kids, kids are kids, right? Yeah. Uh, you go out to the store and they want you to buy them everything. Nightmare. And his, <laughs> yeah, his mom buys him all kinds of stuff. And so I feel like as the conscientious dad <laughs> that I got to be an asshole and I don't buy him anything. Right. <laughs> so he, he asked me. And I looked at him and I said, oh, what are those cards? And he shows them to me. And they're the old true crime cards that Eclipse put out in the 90s. And I said, oh, man, I had those when I was a kid. I had a set of those. I said, how much are they? He said, they're $6 a pack. I said, son, put that shit back. He <laughs> said, what do you mean, dad? I said, put it back. I'm not buying you $6 a pack cards just so you can throw them around. Right. I'm not spending that money. And he said, come on, dad. I said, listen, I could make those cards. And then I stopped and I thought about it and I was like, you know what? I couldn't make those cards. Yeah. And then on the way home, I'm driving home and I don't know why the idea just hit me. And it was like, you know, you could make a game out of that. And now I haven't created a game in 20 years. And it just hit me that I could make a game out of it. By the time I got home, I sat down. Uh, it took me about an hour and a half. I sketched out the original plans for Killers the Card Game. And within another year and a half, two years, we had an actual playable demo of the game. And, you know, part of that, it took me a long time because I had to figure out, at the time, I had no idea how to actually publish a game and how I could go to printers and get these cards printed. And I didn't know that there were companies out there that'll do that that all, all you right. have to do is upload the artwork and everything. And then I had to realize, well, how the fuck do I do this artwork? I don't know how to do any of that. I had some basic, very low level uh, graphic design skills. And so I was like, all right, I, I, I don't have anybody else and I can't afford to pay anybody for it. So I'm like, I gotta do this myself. So like you look over my shoulder and that is the original box okay. uh, art for Killers the Card Game. And so, of course, the box isn't quite that way now. The faces aren't on the front of it. There's now a warning label on it and everything. But uh, that was the original design that I made for Killers. And so, you know, I put together all of that stuff and uh, made it all work. And it got received very well. And uh, sometimes in certain circles, not so well at all. But uh, <laughs> It's a great game, dude. It, I love that game. I appreciate it. It is. It has been surprising to me uh, the feedback that we get from the game. 
And, you know, of all the people that have played it, I have never gotten back any negative feedback about that game. That's Everybody amazing. has loved it. That's now, amazing. some of the, some of the people, you know, maybe they just don't tell me and they just don't engage, but right. nobody has ever been like, this game is a piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> most people buy it. And, and honestly, I expected that. I expected it to come out and people to laugh and be like, this is bullshit. Why, why would somebody even make this? And I, up until probably a year ago, when I sold over 2,000 copies of the game, was still terrified that I was going to have people calling me in the middle of the light, like, what is this piece of shit that you sold me? <laughs> and uh, and that has never happened. And I've been, you know, it, it's been really great that that's the case. Yeah. But I'll tell you, as, a, as an independent game creator, I'm always terrified of that. Like, somebody's going to be like, what a piece of shit, Jeff. Right. And uh, I've been fortunate that that has not happened and we we actually created a game that has a, a lot of substance uh, that, you know, when people first look at it, they're like, oh, well, this is just a bunch of killers. You know, you're playing like uh, um, Clue or something. And then they actually play it. There's a lot going on. Yeah, that there are real game mechanics in the game. There are right. real uh, things to do. Yeah. So uh, people that play games love it. So. Yeah, and if, excited about if that. you're checking this video out, I mean, we've got a demo of the of the game on the channel. I'll try to uh, uh, link to that uh, in the description here, so you guys can actually watch us play it. Um, but my wife, uh, my co-host, and his girlfriend played it here in the studio, and we video we recorded it. But, uh, you know, it's a role playing game and you get to, you know, solve crimes and there's clues left behind. And it's very fascinating the way you you put it all together. And from somebody might like myself, that's a big true crime consumer, as well as a person that, you know, talks about it every week on a podcast and does videos here on YouTube. It it was cool because there's a lot of really good obscure ones in there um, The 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 people you put in the decks. Um, and there's also the big names, the Manson, the Dahmer and BTK and all that. But there's also some of the more obscure ones that we've covered on the podcast, which I thought was super cool. Like, you know, Howard Unruh and some of those, you know, really cool that you did that and uh, did an interview with somebody here recently. You'll get a kick out of this. And we were talking about serial killers. And I think I don't think he was trying to stump me, but I think he was trying to throw one out that he thought I wouldn't know. And he said, Nanny Doss. And I was like, oh, yeah, the giggling granny know all great. about Nanny Doss. We <laughs> just did that on Murder Metal Mayhem. So, yeah, it was like, wow, really? I'm like, oh, yeah, we've 255 episodes. Uh, that's a lot of a uh, lot of serial killers we've talked about. So I, so, would, go ahead. I was surprised. Uh, the most obscure card in the game is Caetano Santos Godino. He is uh, the demon midget of Argentina. And I was surprised that there was a podcast just recently that did an episode on him. Oh, wow. And uh, and I listened to it. It was really good. They did a good job with it. And I was uh, I was surprised because, you know, he is for sure the most obscure in the game. Uh, about even the, the super, super uh, true crime buffs, about 90% of them don't know who Caetano is. And so he's one that I always use to when I'm describing the game, when people come up and they're like, I know everybody in this. <laughs> and I'm like, I got over six, oh, close to 600 killers in this game. I bet you I have at least one or two that you don't know about. Right. And uh, the other one is, uh, oh, my goodness. Why can't I think of his name? He's nicknamed the Sorcerer. It's Ahmad Sirhaji. And that is another fascinating case uh, over in Indonesia. Huh. But, uh, but yeah, uh, oddly enough, I, I tend to know a lot about this stuff. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so now you got this new game coming out. You got a Kickstarter that just started uh, called The Profiler. So why don't you let us know what, what's, what's that game about? Okay, so we already talked about Killers. And Killers is a, a role-playing card game. And so the profiler is a social deduction game. So what that means is it is a large group party game uh, for six to 15 players 
and it is basically a primer on crime scene investigation. Uh, we've you mentioned this already. One of the things that I personally love to do and is very important to me is authenticity in all of my games. Like I'm not bullshitting anybody no. and I am not putting out things there uh, to romanticize or to make light of anything. Now there are a lot of funny things in killers and there's a lot of humor in there, uh, but nothing there to mask the atrocities that happen. Right. right. So I, I always want to remain very historically accurate and really give people an experience. This is not about, uh, you know, it, it's fun, but it is also an experience. So yeah, and you're not glorif you're not glorifying what these people have done. Same thing on Murder Metal Mayhem. I mean, we talk about some of the most awful people on the planet, and we make it known that we feel that they're awful. So that's an important Absolutely. distinction to make. I think. Absolutely. So kind of what we did with the profiler is we wanted to flip it on its head a little bit. And so the profiler is more focused on finding the killer versus being the killer. In killers, the card game, you are the killer. And in the profiler, you are largely the investigator. Now, in the profiler, you have 60 minutes to figure out who the killer is what and what kind of killer they are to win. Uh, I mentioned this before we started the, the interview, but we play tested it last night uh, at a little bar here in Cincinnati, actually a big bar here in Cincinnati. Uh, we played it last night and we actually had a girl uh, that was there that used to work for the police department. Oh, cool. So she used to be, in, uh, I don't know what she did. I don't know if she was an officer or in dispatch or whatever, but she worked at the police department. And so she was very, very familiar with a lot of the concepts and she loved the game. Cool. She was like, God, this is, this is so much like, like trying to investigate a crime. Well, that was the goal, right? So in the game, you have a killer. Uh, one of the people that's playing is the killer. Uh, then you may have a henchman. That's somebody that's helping the killer and like trying to deflect uh, them finding the killer. And then you have the townsfolk. Uh, and then you have an FBI agent, a medical examiner, and a forensic biologist. You may also have a good cop and a bad cop that can influence the game. Uh, but anyway, in the game, uh, it starts off uh, in day and night phases. So during the day, the townsfolk get together uh, along with the killer because you don't know who the killer is. And they all get together and they investigate all of the evidence and all of the crime scene information that they have. So they start investigating these crimes. There's evidence there, like the cops found a gun. They found some D, uh, well, not DNA, because there's no DNA in this game yet. Uh, but they may have found some blood. They may have the blood type. So you'll be investigating all of that stuff and trying to determine with the evidence who the killer is by who is acting weird in the group and maybe evasive or whatever. Uh, that's the social deduction part. And you're trying to piece together the evidence. And if that tells you what kind of killer they are from the real FBI profiles. So you have a power and control killer. You have a lust killer. You have a visionary killer. You have a mission oriented killer. You have a comfort killer and a thrill killer in the, in this, original game cool. so you'll be trying to figure out who they are and so by the end of that 60 minutes if you can arrest the right person and identify what kind of killer they are the townsfolk win if they don't do that and the killer outlasts them or evades them then the killer wins interesting Interesting. And, and you use Kickstarter for this. I pledged and, and ordered one because it sounds like a, a fun game for me to play. But uh, what do you think about Kickstarter for that kind of thing? Do you like using that platform? Uh, I was dreading this question when I read it because I have uh, – <laughs> I use Kickstarter as a platform because Kickstarter is the most prominent platform out there. I am not a fan of Kickstarter. Uh, I do not like the way that they collect money. Uh, I think the way that they do it is terrible. 
Uh, I think it allows for a lot of uh, backstabbing. Uh, but anyway, uh, the way that Kickstarter create, collects their money, like for example, right now, I have people that have pledged to back the Kickstarter. Well, if I do not get to my funding goal, which is six grand, nobody gets charged, no money uh, gets charged or anything. And everybody, you know, it just doesn't end up being a thing, right? It just gets canceled. That's it. Now, Kickstarter will not charge you until after the, uh, the campaign is over. Now, there's a couple issues with that. Number one, what often happens is, and of course, this is purely from a business standpoint, people will, uh, you know, something happens, their car breaks down, you know, uh, Aunt Jenny needs a, needs a new necklace, uh, you know, you got to buy some groceries. You didn't work as much this week. And so what will happen is people will be like, oh, this event happened in my life. I can't back that and they'll cancel their, their thing. Right. Well, if, if you're close to your goal mm. and that knocks you out of your goal, you will not fulfill and you won't get any money and you're dead in the water. It's a very scary thing for a creator yeah. because you got to wait that full 30 days uh, or 60 days or whatever, however long your campaign is, you got to wait that full time to see if you're even going to make it at all. Right. And so it's like, it's very nerve wracking for the creator to be sitting there worried every day, like, all right, are people going to be back in this? And so the other thing that's really, really difficult, and this has become a growing trend on Kickstarter, is that big companies have come in and, uh, and it's the same in the gaming market. The big companies like Gloomhaven, you know, uh, there was one that just released, uh, I forget what it's called now, but anyway, they're making over a million dollars on Kickstarter, right? Sometimes two and a half million dollars. And these bigger companies, they have the money to pump 10 or $20,000 into their marketing so that they're getting all of these people and they're getting all of these emails and they're getting all of these things. And then they have the money or maybe have the money to make all of these really expensive miniatures and shit like that so that everything is beautiful and done. But that's not what Kickstarter was originally around for, right? Kickstarter was originally started for the little guy like me right. as an indie publisher to get the attention of people worldwide that are interested in backing and supporting new products coming to the market. And what it has become is a way for these big companies to tout their newest, biggest, best thing with their shiny new packaging. And the little guy gets left behind and gets fucked because I can't compete with all of the nice, new, beautiful shit that's coming out uh, because I don't have the deep pockets that these big companies have because they just got two or three million dollars in their last Kickstarter. Right. So it leaves us behind. And so what Kickstarter does is if you don't get funded in the first day, they will not make you a project we love. And if you get the, the, like the backing of Kickstarter and become a project we love, then you get all the marketing that goes with that for free. So they'll blast you through all of their marketing, all of their emails and everything. So what you'll see is if these companies get back the first day and they make enough money for Kickstarter, Kickstarter will promote the shit out of them and they'll end up, there's a, there's a game right now. And this may be one of the reasons why I'm struggling is there's another social deduction game. I didn't realize it came out uh, that's on there right now. And it is currently at like, uh, I think six and a half thousand, uh, six and a half, uh, $650,000. Wow. Right. They're sitting at that. They've got like 4,600 and some backers right now. And so they are really like, but they're a project we love. Right. And they're all they're releasing is an expansion, but they've made a, over a half a million dollars already. Wow. They're, they're long, fully funded. They were looking for 50,000 and now they're, they're going to blow that away. And it's like, I'm sitting there as the little guy, I've got currently 14 backers at $1,047 and I have slowed to a crawl, but it's cause I have no real promotion from them. Uh, I'm busy trying to get it out, but I'm still the little guy. Right. So it, it makes it hard. I've made 
uh, a big impact or I've made a small impact in a large ocean of games. And so for me, uh, I'm also the guy that is on the fringes of gaming because I do all the true crime stuff that nobody is, everybody's afraid to touch because we live in a, a sensitive time in our history That's and true. people are real, real fucking uh, wishy-washy. They, they don't want to offend anybody. And, uh, and I'm not trying to offend people, but I'm also not backing off right. from dealing with sensitive topics. No. Uh, like, for example, in The Profiler, we have a trigger warning that has to be read before you play the game. And it goes a little something like this. You know, uh, I basically tell people, you know, this is an adult game. We're going to cover some very sensitive topics, including rape, sodomy, sexual assault, uh, you know, all of these things that are going to be included as topics of discussion in this game. If you are not comfortable with that, this is not a game for you, right? We are investigating, and even though the crime, uh, the the uh, the profiles or the the case studies are all fictitious, they are derived. I wrote them. They are derived from real crimes, right? They're not the real crimes, but they were inspired by real crimes. Right. We're talking about dismemberment. We're talking about finding somebody's head in a trash can. Right. So like when you're investigating that stuff, there's no backing off. Like we got to go all the way right. because we're talking about something that could be real. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we give that trigger warning on purpose because I want people to know that up front right. before you start playing it. Because mm -hmm. if it's not your thing, it's not your thing and that's fine. But if you want to jump in and you want to get real and you really want to understand what it's like to be a cop that goes to a crime scene and there's five pieces of evidence and you got to piece together what the hell happened here, this is the game for you. Right. How do you like the uh, trigger warnings I've added to the beginning of the podcast? <laughs> I love them. They're fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I figured you would. Bunch of machine gun fire and bombs blowing up and stuff. But uh <laughs> Now you've uh, you you you're now proving that you've got more in the tank than just cranking out some games. You got a book coming out in April, so why don't you why don't you tell us about that, Jeff? Oh baby, this has been a wild ride for the book anyway. So uh, I have had I think this is actually my fourth attempt at writing a book. I've got three other books that I've written or <laughs> tried to start writing, had a concept idea, wrote an introduction, maybe one chapter, and then it disappeared and it was like a fart in the wind. And uh, I just lost interest and never completed any of that. So I got to the place where I was like, you know what, maybe I'm never going to write anything. Uh, maybe that's not going to happen. Well, then when I got involved with the gaming and everything and uh, my buddy, John Borowski, and uh, Steve G and Angelo ended up pulling me on stage. Actually, you were there the first time I was pulled on stage. Uh, we were at um, uh, Dark History Con. Right. And it was that very, very first Dark History Con that we were at together when we met. And John was doing a panel on serial killer culture. Right. And so we, we knew each other previous to that because he purchased the game when it was on Kickstarter. And so uh, he comes to me and he's like dude he was like are, are you doing are you going to come on in the panel and i said i said no i'm, I'm not slated for that and he said he said why not i said because nobody asked me he said well i'm asking you come on <laughs> so i went and uh and they put me on stage with them and they didn't know this at the time but i have done a lot of public speaking uh i've been doing public speaking for the last probably 15 years and I had been out of the game for probably seven or eight years. I hadn't done anything. And I was really starting to look for something that I would have a platform and I could go and speak again because I enjoy doing it. Uh, if you can't tell, I can't shut up anyway. So uh, it's kind of a natural <laughs> fit for me. Right. And so I was looking for something. And then those guys put me on stage and john uh is a very prolific documentarian uh he does all the big serial killer documentaries right very very famous in his avenue 
Uh, he did the H.H. H. Holmes documentary, uh, Carl Panzeram, Fish. Albert Fish. Yeah. And he has the Gacy one that's coming out right. uh, in the spring. Uh, actually, it should be coming out by the end of this year, I think. Wow. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. Yeah. And uh, and Steve G. and Angelo literally wrote the book on the psychology of the serial murderer. And mm-hmm. he is a professor. Uh, I think it's a, over at uh, Illinois University. University of Illinois at Springfield. Yeah. 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 So and uh, just an incredibly awesome dude. Worked for the police department. Yeah. Uh, has a lot of experience in that. And those are the guys that put me up on stage. And it was really funny because when that happened, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing up here? I'm sitting up on the stage and I'm in my serial killer vest and my skin hat with these two guys that are like the giants in the field of like legitimate right. true crime. Right. And I'm fucking this. I'm like this sideshow act. And uh, they put me up there. And we just kind of ran with it and it ended up going really good at the next show that we were at all together. They pulled me up on stage again. And then ever since then, I've been doing talks on serial killer psychology. You and I got together on Murder Metal Mayhem. And so it's been really, really cool, that kind of development. Mm -hmm. And so that all kind of rolled into the book. And so I was I decided to start writing it. And a lot of people don't know this, except for E.J. Hammond. She knows it because she was around for me starting to write the book. I wrote the book in about a three to four week period. Wow. Right. Uh, And so I started out. It was going to be one book in four part or three parts. It was going to be part one was going to be serial killers. Part two was going to be criminals. And part three was going to be cults and religions. Well, I got to chapter four about five or six and I was over 30,000 words and I realized that there was no way in hell this was going to be one book uh you know to be an 800 page book that would just be a textbook so I didn't want to do that so then we decided and I think I told you this when I when I made this decision uh that I was going to break it up into three volumes uh and so EJ did the foreword for the book and EJ Hammond, if you guys don't know that are out there, uh, is another author and she is currently, she wrote uh, part of the screenplay for the new movie that's coming out. It's a biopic on uh, Derek Lee Todd, who was uh, a serial killer down in Louisiana. Yeah. And uh, he's, uh, what is it? I can't remember his nickname now, but anyway. Uh, he's a serial killer, and Bishop Stevens is playing Derek Lee Todd. Oh, but cool. EJ wrote the screenplay for that, and she also wrote a book uh, that's actually with uh, <laughs> Fabian Richard in uh, in France. And I've showed this before. I yeah, just happen Bundy to have book, it right, right next to me. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, called Ted Bundy: Memories of the Beast, and so she wrote that, and that just came out. Uh, I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half ago, something like that. And uh, so I asked her to write the foreword to my book and her only request was, is I need to read the whole thing before uh, I write your foreword. And I was like, that's respectable. I, I get it. You know, right. you want to make sure that you, you have an idea. You don't want to write a foreword when you don't know what the fuck the book is going to be about. Right. So, uh, so she read it all and she said, Jeff, this is really fucking good. Uh, you need to submit it to some real publishers because originally I was going to release it January 15th and I was just going to self publish on Amazon and get it up there and do the whole thing, you know, uh, because I self published everything else. Uh, so because of EJ, I decided that I would submit it to a couple publishers. So I submitted to three different publishers. Two of them were bullshit. They were just vanity presses that wanted to take my money and she had warned me ahead of time like you should not be paying to publish your book if they come back at you and they want you to pay three grand or some crazy ass number don't do it it's a scam Mm -hmm. they're not going to do anything so i said okay cool uh so i submitted to three one of them was a real publisher and a couple friends of mine are already published through them uh my buddy uh uh Oh my goodness. Uh, Bill Kimberlin is published through them. 
uh, the siren of uh, San Quentin. Uh, and I can't remember her name right now, uh, but she did. Uh, uh, Laura Brand is also published through them. And so she is the one that did all the interviews with Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. And so she's publishing a book through them. And the publisher is Wild Blue Press. And they are one of the top true crime publishers in the country. Right. They uh, currently have four best uh, New York Times bestselling authors in true crime on their stable. And they immediately picked up the book. They loved it. And so I was super excited. Uh, they changed the title of the book <laughs> because. Uh, Which happens. Uh, and, yeah. And it's not any it's not really any different. Uh, I was calling it True Crime Myths and Legends. The new title is Beyond the Headlines, True Crimes, Myths and Legends. So they just made it better. Uh, right. And so they are working on a new cover for it. But I literally just submitted, I think on Thursday, the first round of edits. And if you're a publisher or you write books, uh, your books go through several different editing processes, right? right. It's not just one. Right. Uh, I actually have to go through three editing processes. And we went through the first one. I submitted the edits. But what was really cool to me is the first girl that, uh, that went through and edited the book, about 60% of her feedback was all positive. There were a lot of things in there where she was like, this is excellent. Uh, I love this sentence. Uh, you did a really great job of putting this in here. Then the other 40% were things like, hey, the, the narrative really slows down right here. Uh, maybe you should add this or this to speed it up. Right. You can cut down, maybe take this sentence out or that sentence mm -hmm. because it's redundant. You know, just yeah. stuff like that that really speeds up the pace so people don't get bored when they're reading. Right. Uh, so, you know, and all of those edits are suggestions from them, you know, because they just want to make the book better. So it's sure. more reader friendly. Mm -hmm. So we are now into the second and third editing process. And what's really crazy to me is it took me probably three weeks to do these edits because I've been at conventions nonstop. Uh, you already mentioned I'm fucking busy. And so they were messaging me like twice a week, like, Hey, how are you coming along with those edits, Jeff? How are you coming along with those edits? Uh, <laughs> because our our launch date is in April. And so they were kind of sweating like, damn, he's not getting these done very fast. Right. And I said, next week, I will get them all done. And I'll have it in. So I did. By Thursday, I got them in. My due date was this Sunday. I got it in early. And they said the, the next edits are not going to be nearly as extensive. And I was like, good, because I didn't think the first ones were extensive, to be honest. Uh, I thought they were going to be like, this fucking sucks. Rewrite this whole section. Right. And it was not like that. Uh, so on top of that, they have been really hitting me up about, hey, when are you going to have volumes two and three written? Do you already have the manuscripts? And I said, no, I haven't even started. Like, y'all got to wait until I'm done with this Kickstarter. And as soon as that's done, I'll start writing the next two. Right. So... Uh, what was really cool to me with all of that is that they are so interested that they aren't fucking around. They're like, hey, we want volume two and three because we want all this stuff to come out because we think it's going to be a really big hit. And I read and I think I even sent this to you, but I read the write up that they did of me a couple weeks, like a week ago. Mm -hmm. And the write up that they did, I read it. I was like, holy shit. Like. Uh, they're either really, really great at writing uh, or they are trying to build this up to be a really big thing. And I was like, man, that, that's super cool to see yeah, that. Yeah, that is cool. Uh, and I never expected that uh, because all of you that that have seen me or talked to me know that I'm pretty down to earth. Like, I know a lot of shit, but uh, I'm, I'm not like this guy that sits in an ivory tower that all I do is fucking read books, right? Right. Uh, I, I'm also one of the people, so I have a very different perspective than a lot of other people have on true crime. Uh, I'm not just a, a, a like collegiate about it. Yeah, I, I completely get that because I am also not very collegiate either, so I <laughs> completely get that. But that's awesome, man. I definitely uh, definitely want to see the finished product there, and that's exciting. 
And uh, you, you talked about doing a lot of big uh, conventions and stuff. You got any that you wanted to plug, any that, that are coming up? Holy shit, man. I am all over the place this year. Uh, I've been, I've already been down in Florida once, uh, this last like four weeks, man, it's been so nice to recover because I went, golly, I went to Kansas city. I then went to, uh, Pittsburgh or no, I went to Kansas city. Where was I at after Kansas city? I was somewhere close by. Anyway, I was in Kansas city, Pittsburgh, Tampa, and then Richmond, Virginia. And it was just like, like a pinball Wow! in four weeks and, uh, you know, driving probably 30 plus hours in the car to go to these different conventions and stuff was rough. And in the middle, I had a gaming convention that I had to be at. So it was like, it was, just, it was a lot. <laughs> so, but upcoming, I'm going to Philadelphia. I'll be in Philly. Uh, I've got, uh, and that is with, uh, world oddities expo. So if you like the oddity stuff, I am, oh, I'm at like, I think they have 15 or 16 shows this year. I'm at 13 of those. So if you go to their website and check out what shows they have coming up, I'm probably there. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, uh, I'm going to be at um, Gen Con, which is in August, the first week of August in Indianapolis, right? Uh, which is a great gaming show. Yeah, my and daughter the goes largest, to that. Yeah, it's the largest in North America. So I will be there, ready to rock and roll. And, uh, you know, we'll have killers there. We'll be playing it. We'll have the profiler there. We'll be playing that. And I was hoping, you know, if the Kickstarter gets fully funded and uh, I'm there, I will have you. I should, if everything works out the way that I need it to, we will have the mass production units there. So I'll have units to sell. Now, uh, of course... With the Kickstarter in uh, uh, sitting in like limbo right now, I am making uh, some contingency plans because if you know me, I don't give a fuck whether it's going to work or not. I am going to release it no matter what because right. I love it and other people love it too. So I'm going to make it happen one way or another. Right. And you can either buy the buy the copies that I make myself. I'll sign that bitch on the inside. And you will have a game that will be unique uh, because when we go to mass production, I won't produce any more of those. So one way or another, the profiler is coming and I will kick the goddamn door in to make it happen. That's okay. just me. I don't I don't care what the community says. That's awesome. <laughs> and I know we've been mentioning that you come on Murder Metal Mayhem uh, periodically. But what uh, what's that uh, experience been like? Because the podcast is obviously different than this youtube stuff that i'm doing but what uh, what's that been like since you've been been associated with us on the podcast oh it's been great uh i've had i've had a great time coming on the podcast it's been a lot of fun uh to be able to go on there and uh, uh i have uh i've kind of gotten the uh gotten myself uh pigeonholed because every episode i think that you, you guys do with me ends up being the next longest episode. And uh, <laughs> well, you get two Itali that, you get two Italians talking on a podcast. It's all over, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It, it's so funny. Cause like the last one we did with Ted Bundy, yeah. I'm like, I, I looked at the schedule. I'm like, these son of a bitches had to relegate me to a special episode. So they didn't have everything else to do. I'm like, shit. Well, we knew, got, but we got... knew Bundy was going to be way too much for an hour long segment. So that's yeah. why we did that. But that's funny. But yeah, it's been a lot of fun, <laughs> but anything else you wanted to mention Jeff before we part ways? So I, uh, speaking of the, you know, we've talked about, you know, the gaming thing and, uh, I'm going to release this here now. So, uh, all of the viewers and all of the listeners uh, can hear this. Uh, sitting right across from me right now, you, you guys can see behind me is my wall of serial killer shit. And this is my, if you watch the podcast, you'll see it in the podcast that uh, I have, you know, a whole collection of stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is my backdrop for all of my true crime stuff. But directly across from me right now, is a whole wall and a half filled with sideshow stuff. So I love true crime, but I've always been a huge fan of T.T. Barnum and the circus sideshow. 
Uh, it's a, it's another thing that has just resonated with me from the time I was a kid. Uh, I always wished that I grew up in that time where I could go and see the sideshow and see all the circus freaks and stuff like that. And so ever since the beginning, uh, when I created Scorpion Lair Games, I have been interested in releasing a sideshow game. Now, those of you that have met me early on with the skin hat and all that shit, uh, that was all because I was I wanted to do the whole P.T. Barnum larger than life, you know, really drawing people in kind of the carnival barker kind of thing. And I think I did a really good job of achieving that. We got a lot of early success because of that right. and a lot of attention, mm -hmm. whether it was positive or negative attention. It doesn't fucking matter. It was attention. Right. Right. And so uh, everything that I've done has been kind of around that feeling of a sideshow and bringing people in and checking out the weird and the macabre. And so I've always wanted to do a sideshow game. And I finally figured out a concept and how I want a sideshow game to be. And I've seen a lot of other circus games out there and stuff. And I don't particularly like the way that they've done them, uh, mainly because they Again, I, I mentioned in my business, I always want to be authentic and I want to be authentic to the characters and the people that were there uh, that actually did it. And so one of the things that I really, really wanted to do is bring in the real sideshow freaks. Right. And so, you know, Jojo, the dog face boy and the fat lady and the, the human pin cushion and all of that stuff. And I wanted to feature them in the game. And I wanted to make the game all about the sideshow. So it's going to be a deck building game. And you're going to have to, you'll start out with a basic sideshow of three different acts. And you will have a working act. You'll have a created freak. And you'll have a, uh, a real freak, right? And so those were the three real performers that happen in a 10, 10 and one sideshow circus. And so I want to feature that. And so what you're going to have to do is through the game, you're going to have to hire your new acts. You're going to have to pay them every, every turn. They're going to have to be paid right. and you're going to have to draw in people. And so the goal is going to be to be the best sideshow. You're going to have to rule the sideshow or you're going to bust and you're going to go bankrupt. Uh, kind of like playing Monopoly, I was right? just going to say, it and sounds like Monopoly. That's absolutely. awesome, dude. That sounds like so fun. You're gonna, yeah, you're going to be hiring all of your acts and stuff. And so we have some acts that are, you know, kind of made up, uh, you know, just a kind of a generic uh, snake lady and a generic giant and everything. But then you can hire the real sideshow acts that were with P.T. Barnum Circus and everything. You can put them in. Cool. But of course, they're going to cost more right. and you have the risk of bankrupting yourself because you've hired these acts right. and you're not getting enough people. Right. So there's going to be a lot of it's going to be an incredible deck building game. That so that will be out cool. next year. And I'll show you this. Uh, I. So you guys, uh, you may not know this. Pete knows this. The way that I work is. uh is crazy it doesn't make sense and it, it's one of the reasons why people can't keep up with me and uh why i have done so well is i i really don't ever take any time off and i'm constantly working and i will tell you that the game is about 30 percent done already uh it won't release until next year but i've already started working on things oh cool. uh, this is that is the uh gonna be the cover Cool. Uh, it's called Step Right Up, Rule the Sideshow. Nice. Is, uh, and it's got a little carnival barker. But I'll show you. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Well, shit. There we go. There is old Schlitzky, ah, the human pinhead. Nice. Right? So we've got, we've got some real stuff in here and uh, just staying very authentic to the sideshow and how it worked. And of course, being like uh, Scorpion Lair Games, we got to throw in a little bit of intrigue. So there's going to be some cards that you might draw 
uh, maybe your side, one of your sideshow performers was fucking one of the girls in the town you were in, and uh, dad came and blew him away with a shotgun. Oh, so nice. you'll lose one of your sideshow performers. Oh, shit. Because, like, you know, uh, or for example, maybe one of your sideshow performers is strung out on heroin and, uh, you know, can't perform. So you end up having to sub somebody else in their place. Interesting. Right? That was that was legit the sideshow, sure, right? Sure. There were a lot of people, though the the carnies and stuff were the fringes of society. Right. There were a lot of them that were criminals that couldn't work in the regular, you know, jobs and stuff. So they ended up on the sideshow. And so, you know, there were a bunch of criminals robbing places, doing all kinds of the shit in town. And so I also want to bring that in there because that is history. And I want that to all be prominently featured in the game. Yeah. So it'll definitely be a Scorpion Lair Games game. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you got the profiler getting ready to come out. You got the book coming out. And we'll link to all this stuff down below so you guys can get on Jeff's website and get the Kickstarter to order the game like I did. And uh, you got a lot going on, Jeff. Definitely uh, love having you on and uh, always oh. enjoy talking to you. What's that? What? Let me dr let me drop one more thing. I forgot about this before uh, the sideshow game comes out. By the end of this year, we will have another expansion for Killers the Card Game. Nice. And uh, I forgot to mention this, but uh, it is going to be called the Experts and the Accomplices. So you will have. Uh, matter of fact, you may be able to play or have Pete Altieri on your side of the game to influence your characters oh, in the game. Interesting. So we will have, uh, there will be defense attorneys, there will be prosecuting attorneys, there will be podcasts that will be there. There will also be uh, authors that will be in the game that will all be able to influence the different characters in positive in negative ways you will also have the accomplices so for example like gacy there will be michael rossi will be in the game and david cram and they will be able to give gacy certain power-ups or negatives interesting uh, as well as like elmer wayne henley will be in the game and if uh there's a girl that comes up that uh uh that dean quarrel is trying to abduct uh you know maybe uh uh, Elmer Wayne shoots Dean and kills him in the game, right? Just like real life. Right. And so, you know, we want to add that in there because that's been one thing that has really been missing from killers is all of the ancillary people yeah. that could influence the game. Yeah. I see Catherine there Ramblin's go. got a new book coming out about him, which is uh, pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm definitely psyched about that. Well, Jeff, thanks for taking your t the time out here on a Sunday to chat with me. Always fun to talk true crime with you. I look forward to the profiler and the book and everything you're doing. It's awesome to see you out there just kicking total ass. So I appreciate you very much and uh, good to see you, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's always, always a pleasure. Hey, guys. I hope you enjoyed that interview I did with Jeff. Now, I told you at the beginning that there was going to be a contest, and hopefully you paid attention. You might have seen a picture flash up on the screen a few different times, scattered throughout, but it was the same picture. So my question to you is, you see me in that picture, but who am I standing there with? And of course, it's a mannequin, but who is that mannequin depicting? I need you to email that answer to the email address below. And remember that the contest ends on Monday, March 25th, 2024. And that is uh, Central US time at midnight. So you don't have a lot of time, but all you gotta do is email me the right answer. Who am I in that picture with? and you enter to win, and then I'll use a random number generator to pick the winner, but you get a copy or you get a, a Killers the Card game, which is awesome, and an expansion pack, and uh, one of the Murder Metal Mayhem t-shirts. I got extra large and large options, so uh, we'll talk about that if you win. 
but you got to enter to win. So good luck. Don't waste time. Get it in. And thank you for checking out this video once again.